Hello, and welcome to the Warhammer 40k book club. This is episode number five, in which we're discussing the Talon of Horta, Horus by Aaron Dipsky bowden I'm Jen Bozier. And I'm Carrie Honey. And this is Warhammer 40k book club, where we read from a crag. Every episode, we discuss a book that we've selected from the Black Library's Warhammer 40,000 catalog. We post a book on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, along with questions to ponder during reading. Listeners are able to read the book and then tune in to hear our discussion. We encourage participation through Twitter, the site, or Encrypted Box channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read the book, go ahead and visit the site, check out the book in questions, and then come back to this post as we'll be discussing the book from start to finish in great detail. As mentioned this episode, we're discussing the book The Talon of Horus by Aaron Dubsky bowden the book is about the start of the Black Legion as told from the point of view of the first captain, Iskander Kane, previously of the Thousand Sons. Uh, we have a lot of questions and I think we have a big conversation around this because we've already had a lot of conversations over the phone and over Slack. So let's dive on in. All right, well, I'd like to start with something. Um, I was looking back over my notes. Uh huh. I don't have very many notes. And the really? reason why is because I had no idea what was going on for so long <laughs> in the book. Uh, like I told Jen, because like, as you can see down here, you know, I am the rookie and uh, you know, my knowledge is very limited, especially when it comes to the nine legions, as I'm always going to call them from now on. Yes. The Nine Legions. And not only that, but you know, just anything that went on in the Horus Heresy. Because I know you have read, before you read the Horus Heresy stuff, you read the Codices, you read White Dwarf and all that. So you yeah. knew a lot of this stuff. I knew nothing. Like, only my only knowledge is from Horus Heresy, which I just finished book four. So it means like not very much. So there's a lot of stuff in there. I was like, I don't. I don't know who this is, like what they're talking about. So I've constantly had my little um, Warhammer 40k app on my phone, constantly looking up things like, okay, what is this? What is this? So I see my very first notes are for page 127. <laughs> so I think oh, that's wow. where wow. I, that's where I finally, it's like, I think, I think I've caught up. What's going on? Oh my on. gosh. Um, I think my first Oh my gosh, I have so many notes. I think the first thing though, to be fair, I think the first thing that, so I loved this book. This is our first question. Did you like this book? I loved it. Um, I was really grabbed by this from about, well, to be totally honest, I was pretty much grabbed from the first chapter. Uh, by page 30, I knew that I was gonna be pretty stoked about this. And then definitely by the time I got to like page 60 something, I was hooked. I think I even was texting you immediately like, oh my God, this is the best thing. Um, I actually feel comfortable saying that this is probably my favorite book of the ones that we've read for the book cup so far. Oh, wow. Now, I liked it. Um, it took me a long time for it to grab me. Like I said, I think it's because I was so confused. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't understanding not only that, but I did not clue in that. Um, I mean, okay, I'm not dumb. I mean, about that. I knew he'd been captured. Stop. I knew he'd been captured by an inquisitor. And mm -hmm. I knew he was, you know, I guess, confessing all, you know, without really being tortured, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, so I knew he was talking about things that had happened in the past. I didn't mm -hmm. know it was like 10,000 years in the past. Like, I didn't know this was like right after uh, the heresy, right after Horace's death. I thought he was... It's a couple, it's like a century or so after it. Right. But I mean... Well, okay, in yeah. Warhammer time, that's right after. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Literally right after. Right, pretty much. so, like, uh. I... So I thought this was, like, somewhat kind of recent. And the reason mm -hmm. why I thought that was because, you know, I've not read the uh, Night Lord's Omnibus, and I know you have. And I remember you saying that, that in that Omnibus, they make fun of Abaddon a lot so i thought maybe so when he uh is on the vengeful spirit and he's missing i figured it was he took his tail between his legs after the night lords made fun of him one too many times because you kept saying he was a joke like he kept trying to overthrow things and then nothing ever happened and so i figured he's just like well fine nobody loves me i'm just gonna go and let's kind of sulk back here for a while right. that's honestly what i thought it was so, right. 
No, this is definitely, I love, see, I think that's one of the reasons I liked it. So we're actually going to jump ahead and do questions a little out of order here. So the origin story of the Black Legion that was the official lore, like from the codexes, was that they, the sons of Horus go to Terra. It doesn't go very well for them. Emperor kills Horus, they leave, and then Abaddon is basically like, you know what? We're rebranding because we no longer want to be the sons of Horus because he was a failure. So now we're the Black Legion. And I guess that I always kind of assumed that what happened was Horus dies. And then within a couple of years, the sons of Horus are all painting their legion, their armor black, and they've rebranded. And so I guess that was always my interpretation. Not so. And in fact, I was actually a little confused at the beginning when he talks about running into one of the sons of Horus. I was like, wait a minute, why would there still be sons of Horus? So I really, I love this because it made, it made so much more sense and it made it sound like, and I guess I, I use the word rebrand because especially working in the tech sphere, like companies are constantly, right? Like, oh, let's rebrand. We're just going to change our logo and everything. And uh, it, it sounds so trite. And it always kind of felt that way, like Abaddon being like, no, we're the same people. We have the same shtick, but we're totally different because we have a new name. But this felt a little bit more like um, the line that I grabbed that really stood out to me is when he's explaining to Cain what he wants to do. And I also didn't realize because all of the traitor legions and all of the books that I've ever read that take place in the 41st millennium talk about the long war which is the long war is, you know, fighting against the emperor. And okay, Abaddon, thank you. Yes, so that's what the long war is. And I, I always thought, again, I thought this was basically like, the siege of Terra didn't work. So, okay, we're just gonna keep fighting that war. I didn't realize that, again, that was something Abaddon says, uh, let's see, the long war came, the long war, not a petty rebellion swallowed by Horus's pride and his hunger for the Terran throne, a war for the future of humankind. There's also another delightful line where he says that Horus would have sold the species to the Pantheon for the chance to sit on the golden throne for a single heartbeat. Yeah, I did like that. I did like that line. But I love that they create this, they create this legion because they still very much have, and that was one of our questions as well, was that this constant recurring theme of brotherhood for these guys the loyalists and the traitors, and they still want to be part of something. They want to have battle brothers. They want to fight those wars. And so they come together, this ragtag group. I think I joke that it's a thousand son, a world eater, and a son of Horus walk into a derelict ship, right? And the bartender says, I'm just a gene stealer. And the, um, there were no gene Actually, stealers. I think the, the, the bartender is, have you heard about the word of Erebus? So it, um, I liked this concept that all these guys come together. They've lost, because another recurring theme in here was the loss of love and respect for their fathers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, kind of going back to what you're saying earlier about what you thought it was like the rebranding of the Sons of Horus into the Black Legion. That's kind of what I thought as well. And it made sense. I mean, they were called the Luna Wolves. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sorry is a dumb name. You already have space wolves. Do you need moon wolves too? The answer is no. No, you don't. But the, but the rebranding seemed to be a thing, though, because like as I was recently reading in Flight of the Eisenstein, I learned that the Death Guard was originally the Dusk Raiders. Yep. Uh, you know, so it seemed like what it seemed is that they had a Terran name, and then when the Primarchs were found, some of them changed the names. Um, Horus did not. He liked being part of the Luna Wolves, and it wasn't until the end of Horus Rising that he agreed. He made it sound like it was dragged out of him to become, you know, the, the sons of Horus. And with Horus being dead, it would make sense to be like, well, we don't really want to have that to our name anymore. I mean, not yeah, many, no. only if he succeeded would they have, but he did obviously right. did not. So it it made sense to me. But at the same time, though, from reading um, so many short stories that deal with uh, the Chaos Marines, and, or I guess I should say the Traitor, the Traitor Marines, and uh, even the Ultramarines uh, books, uh, now called the Ural Ventress Chronicles, the Iron Warriors 
have people from other factions. Like one of the <laughs> big players in the Ural of Interest Chronicles was um, Ardric Vanes, who's a former Raven Guard, who had it literally burned off of his body and still had his armor, but was part of the Iron Warriors. And so I just figured it was, they just all just kind of, you know, if you've decided to become a traitor for whatever reason, whether it's a traitor legion or not, you could just kind of join whoever. Yes, you kind of can. Um, that is that is true. Although, to be fair, the Iron Warriors book is really the only one, and I'm sure there is another example of this, but it's the only one that I've, I've ever read where they did that. And it didn't feel so much as that was an Iron Warriors thing, so much as that was a Hansu thing. Because Hansu was nothing if not pragmatic. And he's he yeah. was an equal opportunity to go in his fight against the Ultramarines, right? Like, you want to go kill Ultramarines? Come on, we've got coats. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I liked the idea that there was this ragtag group. So it wasn't just the Sons of Horus. Because I knew I knew that the Black Legion pretty much took everybody, but I liked the idea that it wasn't we've rebranded. Anybody who wants to join us, come and join us. Right. It was we have somebody from everyone. Come be part of us. Be something bigger. They just happened to have a lot of the Sons of Horus. Because obviously they're gonna, you know, follow Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. We're on first name basis. So I thought I thought that was a brilliant change of it. I thought that was really good because again, as we've seen in all these Ultramarine story or all these uh, Space Marine stories, that that need for brotherhood is so ingrained in these guys. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting to me. It's almost uh it's almost like a, a very codependent relationship but at the same time it's to me it highlights a very human need like they don't mm -hmm. you know in many senses they've been sterilized and uh yeah you know if for all sense of purposes so they don't have that need for that type of love but they i mean even with the chaos they still have that need for love and hell even the death guard are like you know Nur papa nurgle loves you Yes. I mean, talk about a legion that's all about the love. Even yeah. Though Mortarian has his father's soul in a jar, but you know, I'm sure he still loves him. Um, <laughs> well, but, this one though. The, so the interesting thing about that, you bring that up, and that brings up an interesting point in here. A big theme was, I love my brothers. I want to have brothers. I want to have a brotherhood. Couldn't care less about my failed father. Even Kane, I mean, he doesn't have great things to say about Magnus. And Leor doesn't really say anything about Angron. And we we know quite well Abaddon's feelings on Horus, thanks to this book. Uh, you know, I guess I need to read more of the Horus Heresy to kind of really understand Abaddon's feelings towards Horus. Because where I am, the Horus Heresy, Abaddon like practically worships the ground the sky yeah. walks on. He does. And if it's really because Horus failed, then I think less of Abaddon than, than I could. And the thing that I think the thing that I think the reason that line struck me so much, this is the only counterpoint I would make to that, is that I honestly think I, because Abaddon makes a few comments throughout here that kind of hint to that when he says that Horus would have sold everybody out. I think it was the fact that Horus, he went from being this father and this leader to just, I want the throne. And they even talk about in here too, when he talks about, um, oh, where is that? It's my literal favorite line in this entire, it's probably one of my top five lines in the entirety of the Black Library catalog now. Um, oh, we dang, where's this? Oh yeah, I gotta find it now. Um, I just highlighted it in bright green. So I was like, oh, that'll make it impossible to not find. Oh, there we go. Um, so it's in two, page 296 where Cain says, only a madman heeds the four gods promises as anything more than a teasing possibility. The best way to survive living in the eye of terror is to understand the war. The best way to prosper is to master it. The quickest way to die is to trust it. Right. And yeah, I like that line too. Oh, it was brilliant. He mentions a few times that Horus trusted the gods. He trusted the warp. 
So I think Abaddon, I think he goes from loving Horus to realizing what Horus was. That Horus was a puppet at the end. And he failed. But it's not just that he failed. It's that he gave himself over to this so completely and utterly. Because even Abaddon still at this point, he's still kind of, I like to use the warp. I like to use chaos. I'm not a puppet for it. I'm Mm -hmm. using it. Right, and I think Kane feels the same way. Very much so. Uh, but, you know, as for Kane feeling about his father, like, he didn't really mention, he mentioned Magnus, like, every now and then. Mm-hmm. Um, but it almost seemed, because one thing I found fascinating, so I can't wait to get this part in Horace Heresy, he said the last time, he said his last time his father had ever looked at him, I should have written this down, with any fatherly love was before... Cain made him bow down. Right. So that I think we might actually get to see in here because it's when the Primarchs are basically forced to acknowledge that Abaddon's running the long war. The Primarchs who are still alive before before and after they ascend to demonhood, they have to be like, okay, Abaddon's in charge. We get this. We're on we're on board with Abaddon's plan. I don't know how. I, that's one of the things that from like the codices they've mentioned it, but the things that I've read haven't really detailed that. And okay. so because that happens post heresy, I don't know when we're gonna get to see that or what. But I also so that kind of bridges into another one of the questions that we had that I found very interesting. Cause Cain talks extensively about the chaos gods. He talks about the youngest god. I also love that he doesn't use their traditional names. He talks about... Yes, it was wonderful for me. I had to go look stuff up and ask questions. <laughs> okay, you knew the war god and the blood god. Um, okay, yes, it gets in the youngest god. I was like, is that Slanish? That's what I'm thinking. Because he keeps talking about Emperor's children, but I'm confused. No. Yeah. Yes. So... He talked a lot about the youngest god. He talked a lot about the war god and the blood god. And he talked a lot about the god of life and death. The changer of ways was very curiously absent. I don't think Zinch is mentioned or even referenced once in this book. I don't think so either. The closest it gets is is mentioning that Magnus is gone. Which I'm assuming that Magnus is a demon prince. Um, I also had this big feeling that Cain, I got so many thoughts going on at once here. So I think the other thing about with the, uh, the breaking from their fathers is that not only, okay, so Horus failed. Okay. And he did put, and you know, Abaddon was right. Horus did put this whole thing for his own personal ambition. He was absolutely, absolutely right on that. Like, uh, like I think I even wrote it down, like page 354 where he talked about how that he wants to build a new brotherhood not as slaves to the emperor's will and cast in the image of his flawed primarchs bound together by loyalty and ambition not does not nostalgia and desperation untainted by the past no longer the The sons sons of failed failed fathers and you know um you know i guess when you're no longer it's one thing i've loved a horse heresy as a uh, every time they talk about being in the room with a Primarch, they all go to mush. Like, they don't know what to say. And I, I guess the closest thing I think of is, like, if an angel is in your presence, you just, you're so odd. You don't know what, what, what to say or what to do. And so Horace had this way about him. He even had this way about him before he fell that you would do anything for him. He looked at you like, oh, okay, you want to go sit on the golden throne? I am with you. I will do everything. And then when Horace was gone, it was something like, oh my God, we risked all of our lives for what? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I can, when that, when that gets taken away, I can totally see that. But as for everybody else, I think what is even for uh, Leor with Angron and um, Kane with Magnus is, their fathers left them. They became these demon princes and just went, peace out. You're on your own. Have fun. They're like, well, okay, um, thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. And and I think the other reason why Cain doesn't talk about, uh, how you say it, Zinch? Zinch that, that much is because, well, what, what happened with Ariman? You know, if 
<laughs> if they hadn't, if Magnus hadn't gotten them over to Zinch in the first place, Ariman would never have felt this need to save everybody that didn't right. have, that, that wasn't psychers, and therefore the rubricade would never have happened. I think, did I bookmark that? Because this is another. God, there's so much stuff in this book that differs from the traditional, well, not differs from the traditional lore, but expands upon it. So, like, Araman, it's always funny because everyone talks about Cain, the betrayer, right? And they really demonize Cain, or Cain, Karn. Karn okay. The betrayer. Yeah, you're like, who the hell are you talking about? Like, Karn. It's like, well, is this something that happens later? Cain's a betrayer? You're like, spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, so the fact that Karn was this big betrayer because he killed hundreds of his own warriors because he goes into these berserker rages and you can't trust him and blah, 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 blah. Armin, Armin straight up kills half of the Legion. Just straight up kills him. Well, like, but I well, find zombieizes him, I guess. I, you know what I find funny about that? I, I think I think Armin was the first captain. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Karn was. I'm assuming this. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Um, kind of noticing a trend here. The first captain. Yeah. Um, any, anyway. Um, Lucius. Lucius wasn't first captain, though. Oh, no. What's his face? Oh, God. I can see his name. Anyways, doesn't matter right now. All right. But, so, yeah, the nice little trend. Little well, trend. right. But so with Magnus... So Magnus did everything wrong. Magnus is actually the embodiment. He's, he's the Warhammer 40k embodiment of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions. Yeah. Well, and Armin too. And that's, that's what I was saying. So like, so we have Magnus messing everything up on the road to good intentions. And then his first captain follows in the exact same footsteps. Well, it, that part, so when we talk about, like, our favorite parts, that part, I cried. I will shed a tear. Um, which is big for me. They, that description, because Araman definitely had good intentions, but again, it keeps coming back to that line that I highlighted where he talks about the, the, the most dangerous thing is to trust the warp. Magnus trusted Zinch in the warp. Araman trusted Zinch in the warp. Picking up a what? trend here. Was it, does Armin trusting the warp or did he think he had more control than he actually had? That's what I got from it. He, so the official lore of it is that he's trying to figure out a way to stop this mutation. And then suddenly he gets the inspiration for it coming directly from Zinch. Who's like, oh, no, no, no. Here's what you got to do. And that's how you get this monkey's paw. So it's actually more of a Faustian thing where it's like, well, I'll stop the mutations. Sure, stop the mutations, all right. Um, Does it be careful what you wish for? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a full-on monkey's paw thing, right? Where that is not... That's not how you intended this to go. So that... But again, even in that, he kind of references, but he still doesn't mention... I, it, I would have expected him to call him, like, the great schemer or the changer of ways. Changer of ways is, like, the big title for him. Doesn't mention him. Which... Again, and especially given that is another one of our questions that we have. He ruminates and philosophizes about the warp like a lot, like a lot, a lot, which it works mm -hmm. because it's Aaron Dimsky Bowden definitely leaning out through the book being like, here's what the warp is. But it's great because it's him educating the Inquisition. I love how he's constantly like, you guys don't even understand. <laughs> and you can you can just picture his voice as he's saying this too, probably being like, Ugh. like, you don't even know what you don't know. Right. There's so many lines in here that I highlighted when he's talking and he's like, Ugh, you just don't understand. Like when he talks about the gods, um, the gods exist because we gave birth to them. And what's the line that he says that I like? The warp is a mirror that swirls with the smoke of our burning souls. Without us, there would be no reflection, no patterns to perceive, no shadow of our desires. When we look into the warp, it looks back with our eyes, the life that we have given it. Ow. Yeah. So that, but, and again, what he says is probably true from 
a certain point of view. But who better to educate us about the warp than one of the Thousand Sons? Right. Who are, except for the Rubrique, all psychers. Right. And very and powerful all, psychers at that. Uh, yeah. Actually, you and I had a really fun conversation when we talked about that. So that's, and this is kind of through that first, what made this so interesting is that I think, I have to do a quick, I don't, I think this is the first first person space marine book I've read. And yeah, boy, was it different. And the fact that he so casually, so casually talks about all the sorcery and stuff that he does, right? Like I opened up a a tear in space time just so people could walk through and I lifted everybody off the ground and I hurled a firebolt. It's so different when you compare it to, say, Ravener or Eisenhorn. Which is what what I told you. It's like, you know, they're so limited in what they can do. Like Eisenhorn, he says that he has it. It's funny with Eisenhorn. I know we even talked about this when we discussed the Magos. But, you know, he always puts it in his voice. He always says he inflicts his will. But then we see in one of the short stories in the Magos, he has a little, he's got more power than that. I mean, he can do entire illusions, but he doesn't and it's almost like he, get, he doesn't want to get too close to the warp maybe he doesn't want the black ship suddenly coming by and be like what what's up <laughs> what are you doing the, the black ships are so awful <laughs> you know oh my God. Or, or like you know ravener you know and he was much more powerful than eisenhorn must because that's all ravener has literally is is his mind and he talks about you know wearing not only but wearing one person and holding off this and watching this and you know tearing through the warp but at the same time he's still so afraid of getting too close to the warp and so it's interesting to read those approaches to being psychers and then coming to this where he's just like so i did this and this is really not that big of a deal because we all can do this and we all talk through our we all talk through telepathy and oh wait did you need this let me just pick that up for you you know like it's just part of life. Just well, and it, so two things about that. One of the things I think you and I talked about was that because we're both big Dragon Age fans, it really reminded me of Dragon Age Inquisition when you had a character like Dorian from Taventer. And you remember there's a there's a commentary that is made if in party chat, if you have him in the party with Blackwall, where Blackwall says, he's like, you practically preen with magic. And Dorian's like, why not? Why mm-hmm. should I be ashamed of this? And then if you compare that to Vivian, who my favorite line of hers is when she says magic is dangerous. Anyone who forgets that gets burned. So it's these two different mentalities. And that's all I could think of the whole time was we're reading this is that he reminded me much more of Dorian where he's like, Oh, I've got this. There's no reason to be ashamed of this. I can totally control all of this. I know where the dangers are because again, remember Dorian talks about blood magic and he's like, blood magic is not inherently dangerous. It's just that people tend to want to use more and more of it, right? Right. Same thing with him, where he's like, yeah, there are some limits. Like, you got to be a little cautious, but, you know. I guess that's what I saw between them is like, you know, Dorian, I thought he had some of Vivian as well, in that he knows magic is dangerous. but And like her, he knows, knows where that line is. But at the same time, the difference is, is that, um, you know, she wants to leash people until they understand the dangers where he's like, well, you got to figure it out somehow. <laughs> yeah. Go which, nuts. <laughs> again, right. He's right. like, hey, you just got to figure it out. Just got to just gotta do the thing, which, yeah, listening to some of the stuff that he can do and the fact, the fact that he just so casually mentions, you know, I've got a demon. It's possessing a wolf, you know, from when the bastards came and took over our planet. Just, you know, no big deal. Doesn't everyone have a pet wolf? demon i want one i kind of did too actually especially when he was describing he's like it's a wolf the size of a horse i was like go on <laughs> can we ride like, this <laughs> <I know. laughs> like that's why the people should have them right right uh, which that was another favorite when he talks about the wolf actually there's a bunch of stuff in here too and this was that first person point of view of him dealing with the wolves but one of the things that i had underlined in here is when he said um even now i do not hate the wolves their only sin was to be betrayed by those they trusted in that more innocent age they had no reason to doubt the first war master's words 
So, and I love that they call them the Thugalrach, the deceived. Mm -hmm. That actually, even though I haven't gotten there in Horus Heresy, but you know, I, I know about that, that that happens. Um, that, I don't want to say it was a heartbreaker, but it was very touching. Like it really, really affected me. And almost like Cain, he is probably the most, oh, I don't know. Like in many ways, he's probably the most mature out of all of them. And just in how he's accepted, how it all went down with everything between Arimon and Magnus and Horus and um, uh, the, uh, the world eaters. Like he, it's like, yep, your dad's psycho, but, you know, you're pretty cool. You came and saved me. Right. Uh, the only people he hates is the same people I think everybody hates, and that's the emperor's children. And it's because I wrote this line down because I loved it. Because mm -hmm. he talked about why he hates him so much. And he's like, it's page 165. To abandon all ambition a favor of slaking moral desire, that is a real true fall. Which goes back to problem with Horus um he didn't except except that Horus didn't abandon ambition but he abandoned his loyalty and love to his children for his ambition exactly and that's another thing that I thought was really interesting having this first person point of view or I guess just from this chaos point of view was that <laughs> old grudges die hard so I loved, there's a scene in here when they're talking and somebody mentions the uh, the third. They're talking to, uh, I think it's to, um, what's his name? Telemachan? Yes. When they're talking with Telemachan and they're like, oh yeah, you know, you guys left and abandoned us. <laughs> and Kate is like, oh, this. And I was like, oh, right. And granted, it's only been a couple of hundred years, but he they kind of imply that that grudge never quite goes away. Right. Not that I blame them. I mean, maybe the war would have gone a little better, more favorably for them if the Emperor's children hadn't just been like, yeah, we're just going to go do what we want to do. Yeah, like, we can't sit here and wait. That's boring. It's boring. Yeah, exactly. I, they're just like a bunch of toddlers. And uh, evil toddlers. Um but I like, I like, it was interesting to see all of these different grudges. And also, this is probably, so I joke a lot about that Angron and his, the nails are, the butcher's nails are like uh, Batman's origin story. I'm sick of hearing about them and I'm sick of learning about them. Having said that, previous depictions of the nails kind of made it look like you would start to get angry and then just the nails would just be like yes we're angry and Arr! this was such an interesting take on them mostly because it it's helpful when you have a psychic who can kind of lean in from a first person point of view and say oh this person's thinking this by the way mm -hmm. but when he talks about the nails biting and he talks about like leor trying to control it and bite it back and um the nervous ticks that he gets in his face and the involuntary spasms of his arms and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, it was the most interesting depiction of that because again, it's kind of hard to imagine them and it always just made them sound like they were, and I'm sure a lot of them are just mindless berserkers, right? So it was kind of nice to see a world eater who has the nails, the nails are a problem, but he's not, there's more to him. He's not just, he's not defined by the nails, I guess. Right. So that was, I don't think you would ever have seen that in a loyalist story. <laughs> well, no, because you wouldn't have, I mean, are there any legions, loyalist legions that are psychers? Uh, not entirely psychers. It, right. I mean, you have some librarians. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I know the Dark Angels have quite a few librarians. And then, of course, let us not forget... The best librarian, and that'd be Lord Tigerius of the Ultramarines chapter. Um, but they wouldn't go that far because they're so. Oh, they would never. I don't think they would ever try to tap the mind of an enemy. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know even... if they would tap a mind that much of a of a friend because I, you know, I remember reading uh, the sixth Uriel Uriel Ventress book, and Tigerius was noticed that he was out. 
his was weak at this point because they're defending Ultramar against this onslaught of, uh, of demons. And he's trying to like light these psychic lanterns basically to have the wards keep going. And Cato Sicarius gets all pissy with them and basically tells him where he can bugger off. And Tigerius realizes what's going on. It's because the wards have weakened so much that he's becoming irritated because of this, but he never once taps into Sicarius's mind, see if that is what is going on. And, no. I, and, and I know it's not that he can't do it. I just think that with the loyalist chapters, they're too afraid to do it. It could be that. There's actually an interesting line in that. I'm reading the Unremembered Empire right now in the Horus Heresy series. And there's a psyker ultramarine in there, a librarian. And Gulliman looks at him at one point and is like, what am I thinking right now? And the guy's like, I, I don't pry. He's like, you know, sometimes you're thinking and feeling so hard that I can't help but pick up on, like, your emotions and what you're thinking because it's just so hard and on the surface. But he's like, I don't ever cry. He made it sound like I'm respectful and ergo. And I was kind of thinking that in some places here because he'll be talking about, like, feeling and reading people's minds. And, like, he knows so much that... And he talked, it, that was an interesting thing too, where he talks about like how he and Asher Kai always have a link open together and how they're before pre-heresy, they, they always talk to each other because they could, they had these links. And mm -hmm. I was, it's probably a good thing that they were space Marines and not like having normal human thoughts because talk about invasion of privacy. And that's all I could think of is like, sometimes when he was like saying like, oh, Lior is thinking this and he's thinking that. And I was like, maybe he doesn't want you to know that dude. It just seems so invasive. But again, I think because the Thousand Sons, especially where they were, you know, in Prospero, they were probably taught. It's oh, open. Yes. It's free. It's open. Whereas, you know, the Ultramarines, um, they were either taught not to do it or they were put the fear in them, you know, of, of the warp to not, to not do it. Although, like, I don't know why, like, librarians wouldn't every now and then. I mean, when Cato Sicarius is threatening you, don't you think you want to tap in his mind a little bit to see how serious that threat is? Just, right. Just the thought. Well, everybody knows that he, Cato Sicarius, blows a little bit of smoke. But, so, one of the other interesting things in here, I think, the big thing before we start gushing about our favorite parts, um, so throughout the entire book, he's talking to the Inquisition and he's giving them all this information and setting the stra record straight, as it were, which I thought was very interesting. So the whole time I'm reading this book, I keep thinking to myself, oh, well, you know, clearly, clearly they had a falling out or maybe he's having second thoughts about this whole, whole traitor thing after 10,000 years. Um, like trying to figure out what his motive was. And then we learn. Uh, he tells the Inquisitor in the end, she comes to talk to him and she asks him why he's there, basically. And he tells her that he's exactly where Abaddon wants him. Because the answer is simple. I came because I am an emissary. I bring a message from my brother Abaddon to the Emperor, the master of mankind, before he dies. And uh, she says the God Emperor cannot die everything dies we see the astronomicon dying we hear the emperor's song fading away no one knows that better than those of us who dwell in the eye uh that's a little so at first i think actually i think so the thing i want to say first is that when i picked up this book i was like oh cool a traitor marine book and it's going to tell the history of the black legion and that's so neat I didn't realize that this is definitely fitting into a bigger picture. There's so much bigger picture stuff that's going on right now. Um, oh my gosh. And because I was looking at the copyright date. So this was written before the book Katia Stands. Right. So it's almost like a warning. Like, you know, this is going on. And like, you even text me, you're like, Abaddon's got something you know he's uh, got things in the working he's something's afoot with Abaddon like well Cadia uh, yep. 
Because it was so funny because it made me think of way back when we first heard that Katia fell. Mm -hmm. And you were like, okay, why now? Why are they throwing Abaddon a bone now? So you just, you couldn't let that go. No, I couldn't. It's like, well, well, um, here it is. This is, this is why there's something bigger coming. And, and so it's just all kind of interesting because it was Katia falling that got, um, the Eldar to team up with Belisarius Call to revive Reboot Goleman. And then Mortarion's like, whoa, what? Why does he get to be around? I don't think so. We got to finish this. Who else is going to come out of the woodwork? Because didn't you tell me with the lore that Lehman Russ said he'll be back? when he needs to be, meaning like the end game. He'll be back, Vulcan will be back, and um, Korax, all three of them left with under the guise of, will be back. And I have to imagine that they're gonna do tit for tat. So I have to imagine that right now we have Gulliman and we have Mortarian running around. So I'm guessing that if, I don't know, Magnus comes back, then somebody, how awful would it be if Magnus and the Russ came back at the same time? <laughs> Awkward. Or would, uh, or would Russ be like, dude, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I I would love to think that those two would be like, let's get this straight. Let's get this out of the way first. My bad. Right? I don't know. I don't actually know what that would be. Um, so I think I have to imagine. I feel like here's the thing that makes me nervous. Is this the start of the end of times? Or is this the start of a new time? I just had a, another thought. Well, right. So, like, if you look at the Horus Heresy, which is supposed to be 12 books. Pepperidge Farms remembers that. Um, <laughs> now it's 54 books. I mean, they've been dragging it on for more than 10 years at this point. I So, on one hand, I'm like, is this end game? I, I really did when I got to the end there, and he's like, the Emperor is dying. I heard uh, Doctor Strange. This is the end game. I did, uh, too. <laughs> They can drag it out for 10 years. I know they can, but part of me was like, I don't, I mean, I, I want the gang, I want the gang to get all back together again, but also, I don't, I don't want this to be the end of times. And what, what kind of end time, but when something ends, something else begins. Yes. Um, and we've already seen, we've already seen that a little bit. Um, I have a heart. The Warhammer 40k universe is too profitable for this to be the end times of, oh, it's just, that that's just yeah. it. I don't think they're going to do to it what they did with Warhammer fantasy. Oh, um, I, hope, God, I hope not. Um, but what I'm wondering is, okay, the Emperor's song is dying. Does that mean that the Emperor himself is dying? Or is it just this form is dying? Well, no, that could be. And when all of his sons return, just to say the emperor doesn't return, because especially if we're going to go with the emperor being a Christ-like or God-like figure, a perpetual, he'll just keep on, you know, holding up, you know, Christ rises from the grave. You could have that, which that would be fascinating. He comes back and... Well, they've always said that he's appeared to mankind ever since the shaman birthed him. So he's been returning to mankind. Like right now he's appearing as Keanu Reeves. Eventually he'll come back as something else. Um, That's my favorite thing in Reddit right now. Uh, <laughs> but you could be absolutely correct. Maybe, maybe keeping him bound in this form is actually a detriment. Maybe if they just let this form die, he could rebirth as something else. See now, see now, I'm yeah. thinking of Kevin Smith movie Dogma. Right. Yes, where they have the body on life support. Yes, and they have to take it Maybe. off for God to finally come out of this old man's body. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, that was exactly what I was thinking when I was describing that. Like, because it kind of makes sense to you. Because we, I still, we still don't know what he said to Reboot. And I want Reboot to. He didn't have to tell anybody. No, nope. but can you please think about it a little yeah, can bit? Can you think about it, maybe? Yeah, so we can find out because yeah, what, we have these books. Because, like, because he's you know, sound like his father was angry 
And I right. am, and it kind of came across that he's angry, like you're alive, like you're not supposed to be, or mm-hmm. something, or I don't right. know where have you been <laughs> all this time. I felt that it was more of the latter. And where have you we been? No. Yeah, and because remember he talks about how it was kind of like his father finding his favorite tool. Like, oh, there's that hammer that I set her down, and I need that right now. Is it because he needs the hammer to go and do something, like fight Mortarian, or is it because he's like, I need to get out of this form? That's what I was just thinking. Right, so maybe that, you know, and maybe that'll be end up being the Russ. He's killed, what, two Primarchs and almost killed Magnus, so... You know, maybe he'll show up and sanction the Emperor, since he always does the Emperor's sanctions. Oh, especially if the Emperor is just like, Russ, do you want to be a good boy? Do you want to be a good boy? Russ is like, I do. I do. Yeah. Get me out of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, remember what I had you do to the two Primarchs we don't talk about? That'd be weird. Oh, uh, is Russ the one who got rid of two and eleven? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it, so if you're reading the Horus Heresy books, a lot of times they regard Russ with a little bit of caution. Yes. It's, that would be, that would be why. Well, I don't know if they meant Russ. They'll, call, they'll talk about the dogs of Russ or, you know, talk about the only thing that the dogs of Russ are good for. And Oh, yeah. There's a great line in Prospero Burns where they're underneath the theater at Nikea. Mm-hmm. And Russ, Russ is getting ready. He's warming up because he's, you know, might have to go upstairs and kill Magnus. And he looks at someone and he's basically like, I always get all the shit jobs. But he's also like, nobody else wants to do it. I'm the one who'll do it. It's like, oh, ouch, bro. Because <laughs> um, you're a good that, boy. You're a good boy. He's the goodest of boys. Uh, that was one of the reasons, again, that the depiction made it so interesting in here when he talks about the wolves and I did like when he talks about carrying that axe and he's like look it would have been disrespectful for me to not use this axe mm-hmm. so I was like you got a point <laughs> sorry to argue with that logic but so what game are they playing I have no idea exactly, he's exactly where Abaddon wants him to be are they is the end game the re-siege of Terra I don't know. Is it um is it just where we're just gonna kill the emperor? Uh I don't know. Which I don't know, to me that's a weird thing to say that we're gonna kill the emperor. And the reason why I find that weird is because um if he really is the false emperor, what does it matter he's still alive or not? <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and that's so that's again I don't, I, I'm really interested. So I think that's why actually our next book is going to be Black Legion because I'm like, we've got to jump ahead. I need to see what happens next. And then the third book needs to come out. So he's been too busy, you know, creating new legions. Uh, no, Aaron Dembski Bowden, you got a job to do. Um, no, he literally just wrote a book about creating a new legion. Yes, I know. But that's done now because I have the copy of it sitting on my bed right now. Is it? So is it done? Or is that just the first of many? <laughs> I need the book. Because <laughs> um, I want to know, like, what, what are you doing? Because, um, yeah, he says, I'm exactly where Abaddon wants me. Which, oh, God. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> God. <laughs> well, I opened the page. I opened the book and I saw a word. And I was like, oh, when we talk about our favorite scenes, we have to talk about this. <laughs> um. I don't know what the end game is. Is it just to research? I would hate if they're like, and we're just going to attack Terra again, but this time we're more organized. This time we printed up flyers. You we're printed out more pamphlets. Pamphlets? We'll go take down Terra, okay? Um, Want to come? Pretty much, yeah. Well, exactly. That's what they're saying to the Nine right now, which, yes, I, I do love that label and how they refer to themselves as the Nine, which is funny there's nine loyalists too but there's no mistake of who he's talking about when he says the nine right i actually just i loved his names for everything in here in general so let's gush a little bit what were some of your favorite parts like what parts really struck out to you um pretty much
much anytime Leor opened his mouth. My favorite Leor scene is still... Well, actually, there's two of them. The one is where Kane talks about going through the gate that he opened in the warp. Oh, walks into Leor's fist and he's like, that was nothing like teleportation. Yes. Oh, that ha- I cracked up. We, oh, thought, I laughed so like, hard. I, came, I walked through and right into Leor's fist. <laughs> it didn't crack me up as much as... Oh my god. Leor was the one to break the stalemate, doing so with an absolute failure of diplomacy. Drop your weapon, Captain Abaddon. We're here to steal your ship. You know, it's actually that, that was hilarious. That part reminded me of um, Downton Abbey, where you had uh, Dame Maggie Smith, and she was talking to her friend, and she told her, she's like, you know, what my grandfather always said, when diplomacy fails, use force. That <laughs> just that's like the world eaters in a nutshell. They don't pretty much, but they skip diplomacy. <laughs> just go straight to yeah. phase two. They just go straight to force. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Lior, Lior was so funny, and the and so I love the Horus Heresy book, Betrayer. It's uh, one of my favorite in the whole Paris Horus Heresy section, which is about the world eaters, and I liked a lot of the characters in it. My favorite character is actually a human in that book, uh, Latara. But I've never really liked the Emperor's Children or the world eaters. I was I was kind of like, hmm, okay, whatever. I loved this character, and I as soon as they said they had a world eater, I was like, oh. He's my favorite character in the book, easily. See, I, I like the World Eaters a little bit in um, Galaxy and Flames. Just Oh, right, right. Just because after they survived the virus bombs and then the firestorm bombs and then Angron was blasted down and they're all like, Daddy! <laughs> he comes and is kind of like, what? What do we do? <laughs> like... <laughs> This just yes. this shock's like, you know, like, hey, our dad's here is going to save us. And then he starts killing everybody. It's like, dad, dad, whoa, whoa, whoa. I won't do it again. What did we do? What did we do? Calm down. <laughs> yeah. I liked that just because it was kind of funny. And actually, I liked, um, oh, Loken's interactions with Karn. Because, oh, yeah. Because Karn just seems such a very, of uh, compared to Angron, well, I guess everybody compared to Angron, was so much more level-headed. Yes. Well, that's that's the dramatic irony, right? Is that Angron or Karn was always this. He was always the one to calm down Angron. Like when Angron's losing his mind, Karn's like, calm down, calm down. So when he turns into the, yeah, berserker poster child, it kind of was a little crazy. But yes, he's always a good one. But I, I love Lior. The other guys, they were kind of fun. Like the one who eats the demon and Kane's like, you know, that has no nutritional value. And uh, the world eater is just like, you, but yeah, but you don't understand what it's like to shit out your enemies. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, well, I think it was, it was something along the line of like, I, like the best insult to your enemies to shit them out or something yes, like that. Yes, it was something like that. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I, I got no argument against that. <laughs> you can't argue with that logic. No. Well, and then they had uh, my favorite scene, though. The one that, it, so I loved, I loved his stream of consciousness. So when he talks about when he goes to the dreamscapes of remembering stuff, right? And he's like, he run, he ran up to Araman and the wolves were on Prospero and blah, 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 blah. Like he would just kind of drift in mm-hmm. through stuff. So when Abaddon fights Sigismund. So I know how that fight goes. Technically, very technically, Abaddon wins, but he gets his, he gets messed up. Like Sigismund, Sigismund does not go down without a fight. Uh, he, Abaddon actually gets messed up quite badly. Um, but I loved it. I just loved when they described that because, again, Abaddon, because the only other like recent depiction of him I had seen was in um, the Night Lord's books. And the difference between Talos and Cain is that Talos does not respect Abaddon at all. So his depiction of him was kind of ridiculous. And yeah, just made him seem very 
how we're hungry. And mm-hmm. now, granted, this is coming from the definition of a nihilist because he's a night lord. Um, but they made him seem so much more respectful in this book. So when he seems Sigismund and Sigismund bows to, or when uh, Abaddon bows to him and shows him respect and reverence before they start fighting, right? And I love Sigismund's line when he says, I looked for you as Terra burned in the fires of your father's heresy. I hunted for you day and night. Always lesser men blocked my way. Always they died so you might live. I absolutely love that. And Abaddon bows down, recognizes that this guy is a legit warrior, and then fights him. Because, you know, they got to fight. Right. Um, but I loved that. I wanted more. That was when he did the dot, dot, dot thing that I was like, oh, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can't cut that off. But when the arm and stuff, and when the Rubriquet, when his brother Makari dies a second time. I was going to say, which time? The second time when he looks back and he's like, farewell, brother. <sighs> that got me... And the fact that Horus, clone Horus, killed the wolf. Oh my god. Did you ever... I it's didn't like, really first care. First of all, Aaron Dunsky Bowden, you don't kill the dog, all right? You just don't. don't. kill the dog! You never kill the dog. You never do. People, fine. Dogs, no. I was fine with the blood ward, whatever. She annoyed me anyway. Yeah, actually, when she died, I was like, oh. Yeah. That was a waste of page space. Yeah, but she was technically dead anyway yes actually you know what i will say that was so when abaddon was talking to kane and he says he's like huh so if she realized she was dead she would cease to exist and kane's kind of like yeah i guess i was like "Mm, this is gonna be a big deal later but no not so much no unless unless somehow they bring her back I don't know. So, unless somehow she comes back in Black Legion. I don't don't know. know. She had her moments. I mean, she had her big moment with him on page 256, where she basically is telling him, you know, the way it is with him, that he, you know, the only reason, she's like, you know, why are you doing this? Why do you even have people here? Why are you even looking for this? He's like, because I want the ship. She's like, that's not why you're doing this. You're not doing this because you want the ship. You do this because you want a brotherhood. Well, so she told him that was her part. She told him the way it was. He was like, I don't screw you. I don't need this. He's like, God, she's right. Sucks. Yep. And now he has his family. Her part's done. It's true. Well, because his family were two dead brothers. in, in, In some ways, what a sad existence he lived. He had two husks of brothers, a dead sister that he kept hidden in the bowels of the deck a demon wolf and a dead uh which was technically a dead wolf right that a demon was just possessing and a dead eldar oh and asher kai hmm? oh, well and asher kai which asher kai is he's so salty he um, doesn't seem like a good conversationalist no no <laughs> like, but yeah i mean what a sad existence and so actually i guess yeah at the end on one hand, he loses Geyer, he loses his brothers, the Rubrique, but he's gained living people. Mm-hmm. And I love when they talk about his sister at the end when she's attacking and how like she's curled in claws and she's rising in the tank to fight. Like she has this fire in her again. So he, I mean, it's freaky and creepy as hell, but it's also kind of nice because you're like, oh, so now like his sister actually kind of has a life ish thing now and he does too so she don't kill the wolf i was actually shocked when the when Geyer died i said i was said aloud as i was reading i was like no don't kill Geyer. yeah no you don't kill the dog it's just no i don't care if it's a demon dog I don't kill it i was even sad when cujo died before you asked yes so it just i mean there were there were so many parts of this book that i just loved and resonated with me and got me a little choked up the scene with Armin is still the part if I had a point to just one scene that's probably the one that I love the most and it's it genuinely got me to tear up 
when he talks about, because I can't even imagine, he talks about how he, he can feel Makari and Jador as they're running up, and then all of a sudden he feels nothing from them. Mm-hmm. And how they just stop moving. It just horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. Those... <laughs> That's right. It's like, what else can you say? I mean, it... Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't love the book as much as you did, um, but that's Fair. about, I think it was mainly because of mostly of my, my cluelessness. Um, it was a very educational book for me, um, with, with it, some of the chaos legions and just learning a little bit more about psychers in general and, and the warp, although it sounded like it was an educational book for you as well mm-hmm. in, in regards, in regards to the warp. Uh, I am looking forward to reading the second one. That is, that is for sure, just because now I, now that the stage has been set, I need to know what are the plans. Because <laughs> obviously, you know, Kadia is phase one. <laughs> phase two is question mark, question mark, question mark. And then phase three is profit. Profit, of course, profit. Um, and well, the other thing that I'm curious about is, so one of the things... So what's interesting about this, my husband uh, likes to play the Total War games. He just got three king- the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And so I was reading this book aloud to him because he refuses to read Trick Chaos Legion books. He absolutely refuses. So I was like, this is Aaron Dipsky Bowden. His stuff is great. I'm going to read this aloud to you. And it frustrated him a little bit because Kane definitely, oh man, <laughs> the guy tells stories like my mother-in-law where he starts on a, tra- a path and then all of a sudden he's like, oh, did I mention this one thing that happened over here? And then he kind of goes around the hedge and it's like the Billy from Family Circus. Like, yeah. Like a twist, <laughs> right. So I'm very curious for the next book because I'm wondering where he's going to go. Are they going to talk about all of the Crusades? Are they going to talk about just some of the Black Crusades? Are they going to talk about just the important pieces? Are they only going to talk about like the recent history? Um, yes, <laughs> I imagine we're going to learn so much more about the Black Legion in this. And I am, I am very, very excited. I also wonder if they're going to go, it's mentioned specifically the Sigismund fight on the back of the book. I can't wait for that. Yeah, I'm trying to, trying to look into... I think she asked him a question and he's like oh yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm gonna tell you that that story next mm-hmm. i can't find it though although because it ends with like these are the end times none of you are destined to survive the coming of the crimson path so is that what the black legion this next book's going to be about is about the f- describing the crimson path or is it going to be more like backstories to the to to the to the Black Legion, and then maybe at the very end we're going to get a tease of what the Crimson Path is, again. Right, right. It could be. It could be because it is going to be a trilogy. They have said it's going to be a trilogy. So, okay, fine. Yeah, I. You know what's going to happen is that the third book of this is going to come out along with the third book of Dark Imperium. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to know what to read first. No, we're not. Um, uh, don't do do not do that to us. <laughs> Please don't do that to us. Um, don't do that to us. They might, though. Um, but, you know, it has been two years since this one published. So maybe maybe next year. Has it been Guy, Guy Haley is cranking them out like he's traveling to the future and stealing them. Well, so. Guy Haley's working on another trilogy right now, the Dante trilogy. I know. I saw he's that. Already got, he's, and he already has two of those books done, Dante and The Devastation of Ball. Mm-hmm. And then he's got, like, another one I think he's writing? I don't know. Maybe the oh, dude yeah. just has, like, a ton of ideas. And that's awesome. Oh, it is awesome. Um. Yes, I am... Um, so excited to finish this trilogy and wrap it up <laughs> so that we could read the rest of our stack. Oh, there's not enough time in the world to read the rest of my stack. So true. I mean, like, I look back at these now and I'm like, oh yeah, because we also have to start reading our Primark books. 
too. So. Yeah, I gotta get a little further in Horus Heresy. First, it's, just, it's too much to read. read. The Unremembered Empire. Just jump ahead to read the Unremembered Empire. Unfortunately, it's like some of the books. I'm like, you can totally jump ahead. You're not gonna miss anything. Um, this one, no. It's book 27, I think, and it ties together like 12 books. It's at least 12. So, like. You would be, I mean, you could, technically, you could jump ahead and read it, and you would just be like, oh, this is all interesting, but you wouldn't understand who these people are and why, like, it's so exciting. Right. So, well, do you want to take us out, Carrie, and hype our next book? Oh, we have got so much hype with the next book. So, you have listened to the Warhammer 40k Book Club epi episode, was this number five? Five. Five, yes, number five, regarding... The Talent of Horus, the book one, and the Black Legion. So be sure to join us for our next book, where we get into more Abaddon, Abadoff, with the Black Legion by Aaron Dinskin Bowden. Um, and then I think we're just going to do, do a lot of Aaron Dinsky Bowden for a while, because, well, he, he's amazing. And Oh, my God. Well, yeah, because I think after that, we're talking about doing Spears of the Emperor. Spear, Spear of, of the Emperor. Emperor. Yeah. Which is Dinsky Bowden. Um, just love the man. <laughs> well, it's a good thing he's a good writer. Yes. So, so anyway, but yes, uh, so Black Legion is next, and then we'll get into a Spear of the Emperor, and then we can't plan anything else for a little while, uh, just because we got to get a grip on what we have <laughs> and what's coming. But um, also, we are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Lair Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and the podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crag. Good night, everybody. <laughs>